Okay, if everyone can get seated before we begin. Thanks. Let's save questions for the end, and I'll have these slides available online, so don't worry about having to take pictures. Okay, let's get started. I'm Toby, and I'm going to tell you about how I attained total cloud deployment automation using Azure, Ansible, and OpenBSD. First, a quick disclaimer. I'm going to talk about what I've discovered and what works for me. Before you implement any of these things yourself, please make backups. And make sure you have good, reliable backups before you throw out what works for you to try something new. As far as technical difficulty goes, I rate this talk four multi-tools out of five. I'll be touching on configuring an OS called BSD, which some of you may not be familiar with. It looks a lot like Linux, but it's not Linux. I'll also be diving into an automation tool called Ansible, customizing a RAM disk. What the heck is a RAM disk? Don't worry, we'll get there. And we'll be dealing with a bunch of template files, some of which call other template files. And at one point, I count words with the WC word count utility, so buckle up. For automation difficulty, nothing I'm going to cover should be too sophisticated, but I'm giving this four Robbie the Robots out of five because I think total cloud automation should let us automate all the things. I'll say that again. Automate all the things. One last thing. This is not a Kubernetes talk. I don't use Kubernetes. Not because I don't like it, but because it's not the right thing for me, and it's not the last word in cloud architecture. I'm also not going to tell you my cloud or my OS is better than yours. I've made my choices for good reasons. You probably have your own reasons, and that's okay. Many of you are probably using AWS or another cloud, and, believe it or not, this talk can still help you with your goal of reaching cloud deployment nirvana. So let's start with the Azure Marketplace. Azure offers more than just Windows VMs, and you can look through the various images they have available. On the face of things, they appear to have about seven different OSs and distros. A lot of the images in the Marketplace are designed as third-party appliances. Windows is in there, but so is Debian, and Red Hat, and Ubuntu, and SUSE, and if you sort by OS equals Linux, wow, just three. And for some reason, Red Hat and Debian aren't shown. That doesn't look right. And if you look for BSD, it's even worse. Red Hat and Ubuntu server only. That is definitely not correct. But you can search for free BSD, and that shows you a drop-down menu where you can find a couple different releases of FreeBSD. There's 10.4, and a couple of 11 dot releases, and 12.0, but 12.0 is out of date. I think we're up to 12.1 now, and there's no sign of 13 current, so there's room for improvement with these offerings, especially since OpenBSD is absent when you go look for it. Now, Azure claimed to have added OpenBSD support in 2017, but I'll get to that towards the end. So let's assume there's an image in the Azure Marketplace we want to deploy. How would we do that? Well, we can do it by hand. Most people start out using the cloud this way. You log into the portal, and you click around and create a VM and a username and a password, and you wait until that VM comes up. Then you log into that VM and start configuring it how you want it to be. It looks like this. Here, I'm just filling out a form with my Azure subscription information. I'm asking to create a new resource group, and I'm making a new Ubuntu VM. I'm assigning it a username and an SSH public key I can use to remote into it when it's done. When it comes up, I can see it in my Azure portal, My VM. Now, on the left-hand side, there's a setting called Export Template. And if you investigate that, you can see that Azure offers you some JSON files that describe what you just did by hand. You can download this by clicking Download, and repeat this deployment by running a script. If you check out the Scripts tab, it shows you two options. You can use PowerShell or Azure CLI. Let's look at cloud automation with PowerShell. First, Microsoft has documentation that you shouldn't follow. If you read the docs, you can create a username and a password and define your resource group name and VM name, and then run a bunch of these PowerShell commands that start with new Azure RM something. In PowerShell, they're called commandlets, with the arguments that you've defined. But you'll notice in this example I took straight from the Microsoft web page that the commandlets are so long they don't even fit on the screen. 
You can automate an Azure deployment this way. I certainly have, but we can do better. If you already have that JSON deployment template you downloaded, you can just call one commandlet, new Azure RM resource group deployment. It takes two arguments, the resource group name and the path to your JSON file. And I like to include the verbose argument so I can see what's going on when I run it. And just as a note, you can see I've made this deployment properties variable with the resource group and template path in it. Then I just pass that to the commandlet with an at sign. That is a really underutilized PowerShell trick called splatting, and it makes things much easier to read. This fits on the screen, and if you write PowerShell, you should look at using splatting so you don't have to go putting little back ticks everywhere to line wrap long command lines. It's easy to miss a backtick and break your PowerShell scripts. Splatting is better in almost every situation. So do splat your PowerShell, but don't deploy to the cloud with PowerShell like this. We can still do better. So here's our problem. Cloud services are relatively cheap, and I get good uptime by moving my existing software into the cloud. I could just rewrite all my services in a next generation cloud language, but that would take a long time, and there's no guarantee my new software is going to work exactly like my old software did. I'd rather have the ability to take all of my existing scripts and software and put them on a VM in the cloud where it would run the same as if it were bare metal in a rack in a data center somewhere, or under my desk. This is called lift and shift, and it's usually much more economical than rewriting everything you have from scratch in a cloud-native framework. I might have an easier time lifting and shifting if Azure Marketplace had my exact OS available as an image, but their BSD offerings leave much to be desired, and I don't want to port my stuff to a different OS like Linux or Windows. And no matter how I move into the cloud, if I do it by hand, I am going to make mistakes and have a very inconsistent setup between deployments. I just won't get the same results every time I push bits up into the sky, no matter how rigorous I try to be about it. If I'm doing something manually, I expect that sooner or later I'll miss a hyphen or upload something to the wrong place and not notice it until it's too late to undo it easily. I want to automate all the things. Say it with me. Automate all the things. In order to do this, I'm going to use three different components that turn out to be really excellent to each other in a lot of ways. You already know that Azure is a cloud provider, and you probably know about Ansible. But at a Linux conference, you probably aren't that familiar with the BSD family of operating systems. So why would I choose BSD? I've been using BSDs for a few decades now, but I needed to stop and ask myself, why is BSD the right platform for my cloud infrastructure? I'll tell you right now, it's not the license. The licensing differences between BSD and Linux are incredible. And I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really argue about their respective merits. Have you read the GPL license lately? Show of hands, anybody? That's a trick question, because there isn't one GPL. There's about five different variants. But when we talk about the GPL, we typically mean the version Linus Torvalds likes and uses, GPL v2. GPL v2 is almost 3,000 words long. By comparison, the four clause BSD license is 241. That's 8% of the size of the GPL v2 license. WC for the win. And there's a two-clause BSD license that's under 200 words in length. That's short enough that you can read it on an elevator ride. But that's not why I use BSD. OpenBSD in particular is considered a relatively secure OS. It started as a NetBSD fork in 1996, and their claim to fame is that they've had, quote, only two remote holes in the default install in a heck of a long time. The last remote hole in OpenBSD was in 2007. Just to put that into perspective, when OpenBSD patched their most recent remote hole, the hit single was This Is Why I'm Hot by MIMS. The top film at the box office was 300. This is awesome, but it's not why I use OpenBSD. I use OpenBSD because of its installer. It sounds silly, but hear me out. The OpenBSD installer really is a thing of beauty. Current releases still support an installation floppy image. I bet most of you don't even still own a floppy diskette, let alone need to use one on a regular basis to do your jobs. But floppies used to be a thing, and OpenBSD still supports them. But floppy disks aren't the thing that I like most about the OpenBSD installer. That's just a fun fact. 
The installer is a very straightforward interactive dialog. Each line is structured as question, then a default value in brackets, and you get the option to type in an answer or hit enter to accept the default. That's nice, but it gets even better. In 2014, in OpenBSD 5.5, they added an auto-install feature. We'll get to that in a sec. The OpenBSD installer is really simple, really clean, and it looks like this. Here's a typical OpenBSD install screen. It asks me for a server host name, and it asks me to pick a network interface to configure. Then it asks for information like a root password, and do I want to start an SSH server? Basic stuff. And if you're like me, you've seen this screen hundreds of times. But I don't install OpenBSD by hand very often anymore. And you don't have to install OpenBSD by hand anymore either. Not with auto-install. Instead, we can take the answers we'd normally have to type in in the interactive installer and put them into a response file. It looks like this. One line per setting. First, the question the installer would normally ask, then an equal sign, then our answer. Here, we can provide an encrypted password hash for the root user, and we can add a new user account called Buffy, and instead of a password hash, we can disable password authentication altogether by setting the password to 13 asterisks and providing an SSH public key that we can use to remote into the machine afterwards. A response file is pretty clear-cut if you've installed OpenBSD before. You can set the time zone and allow the OpenBSD installer to partition and format the disk for you automatically. Here, I'm also remotely fetching the install sets over HTTP. The minus X star bit just excludes the X window sets from being downloaded. This example is for a server, and I don't need them. If you're like me, and you want absolute control over your disk layout, don't choose Auto for the partition layout. Instead, you can write what's called a disk label template, and provide that template to auto-install with this line, URL to auto-partitioning template for disk label equals, and then a path somewhere on your network to the file. The disk label template format is very simple. Each line represents a mount point. The first field is the mount point, root for example, or slash var, or just the word swap for the swap partition. The second column is the desired size of that partition, and ranges are okay here. The third column is optional, and it's where you tell the installer what approximate percentage of the total disk you'd like each partition to be. Here I'm setting a 64 meg swap partition, and I want slash var to be between 150 and 250 megabytes, or about 20% of the disk and everything else I'm putting into root. And I want root to be a minimum of 2 gigs and to take the rest of the available space on this particular drive. You can get pretty sophisticated with this kind of syntax if you need it. A basic OpenBSD auto install setup that uses what you've seen so far would require a web server somewhere on your network to host one or more disk label template files, one or more auto install response files, and it's a good idea to have a local copy of the install sets, especially if you do this as much as I do. Installing an OS from a network share is pretty common. I've done a similar sort of thing with Windows back in the NT4 days, and for Linux there's FAI, that's Fully Automated Installation, which is distro agnostic. But in my opinion, the OpenBSD auto install utility is the gold standard for OS installation automation. No other BSD has this built into it. PCBSD had an installation automation feature where you could save the answers you gave during an interactive install and reuse them, but PCBSD doesn't exist anymore. The only thing I found which is close to this is a Linux distro called NixOS, where one command generates a config file and another command installs Linux to the specifications of that config file. Auto install typically looks like this. You boot the install ISO, and at the first prompt where you would normally type I to install, you type A and hit Enter. The default location for the response file is 192.168.0.1 slash install.conf. But as you can see here, that's not where my response file is. So I need to type out the right URL for my network. This is not a lot of typing to kick off an automatic OpenBSD install, and I did it this way for years, but it's more typing than zero, and if you want zero typing, you have to automate all the things. So here's a better way to set up auto-install. 
there's a tool called UpOBSD that lets you customize the BSD.RD RAM disk. That's the file that gets loaded when your ISO boots that contains the install script that makes the actual changes to your disk. UpOBSD is not in the base system, but you can add it very easily with package add UpOBSD. You need super user privileges to do this, so preface the command with do as, or if you like sudo better, that's fine too. To use UpOBSD, you mock up a small replica of the install ISO. You need a directory called 6.5, if you're installing OpenBSD version 6.5, and a subdirectory called AMD64 if you're installing on that architecture, and a subdirectory called Etsy. Here I'm using the file fetching utility FTP in the base install. I'm not actually using FTP, that's just what the utility is called. And I'm using it to download a copy of my response file, and some CD boot files that I'll need to turn this into a bootable ISO. I move CD boot and CDBR into 6.5 slash AMD64, and I echo the string set image, then the path to my bsd.rd file, into the Etsy directory as a file called boot. Dot conf. Next thing I do is run the up OBSD script. I make sure it's installed with package add first, then I give it a set of arguments. The URL to the OpenBSD install mirror I want it to use, the version I want to install and the architecture, the path to my auto install response file, and the path where I want it to put the RAM disk when it's done. Up OBSD fetches and verifies the bsd.rd file for me, opens it up, and puts my response file into it automatically. We wind up with only four files. Two to make the ISO we're going to make bootable, one boot.comp to point to the RAM disk, and the RAM disk up OBSD fetched and into which it merged our response file for us. The only thing left to do is generate an ISO with make hybrid. The resulting ISO will automatically wipe your machine or your VM, so be careful with this. If you burn it to a disk, Label it carefully so no one puts it in their laptop by accident to see what's on it. That's OpenBSD auto install in a nutshell. But there's a lot more you can do with just auto install and up OBSD. You can include the install sets on the ISO, and with a little work, you can put your disk label template into the RAM disk too. The boot ISO doesn't actually mount the contents of the ISO automatically, so you can't put the disk label in the ISO directory. It has to go inside bsd.rd. At least, that's as far as I've been able to figure out from testing this. So keep that in mind when you try this. You give the URL as file, colon, slash, 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 and the name of the disk label template file. But this is all extra credit. You don't have to do this. But if you do, it helps you to attain total cloud automation. And that's why you're here. I'd also encourage you to add an install.site script. This is another OpenBSD feature that will run after the OS has been installed, but before the OS reboots. You can add users and install things in this script, and it's a great way to set up a machine with your preferred defaults, but the most important thing this script should do is run eject cd0 so that your virtual machine doesn't get stuck in an auto-install loop. The big advantage of doing all these extra steps is that you end up with an OpenBSD install CD that doesn't need to fetch anything. The install sets, the response file, and the disk label info that the installer needs are all right there in the ISO. I want to say a couple of things about Ansible to those of you who aren't familiar with it. For the Ansible experts, just sit tight for a sec. To understate things a bit, Ansible is a Red Hat, aka IBM, utility to run commands on target machines. If you've heard of Chef or Puppet, Ansible is a similar concept. The big thing that sets Ansible apart, though, is that it's agentless. I've worked with Puppet, and Puppet needs to run Puppet software on every machine that the Puppet Master controls so it can phone home and get configuration instructions. Ansible doesn't use an agent. The only two things that Ansible needs in order to control a remote host are a host that has a Python interpreter and is running an SSH server. Most of your network servers probably already satisfy both of those conditions. This makes Ansible very versatile because you can start using it on your network gradually and it leaves behind a very small footprint. I really like Ansible. If you aren't familiar with it, I hope you give it a chance, starting with how not to install Ansible. Ansible is probably in your package repository somewhere, and you can install it with apt-get or some other package utility. And yes, there is an OpenBSD package for it, too. 
but I want to stress that you shouldn't install Ansible from a package. The package was added by a package maintainer, and the different maintainers don't get together and coordinate which version their OS or distro is going to have. When you get into Ansible, you start writing Ansible control scripts that are called playbooks, and there are probably going to be syntax changes and bugs between one version of Ansible in one package over here, and another version of Ansible in another package over there. That's going to make the playbook you write over there not work over here. Plan for the future, and set it up as early in your automation as you can to ensure that the playbooks you write today will still work six months from now. Here's how you do that. For my example, I'm using OpenBSD, of course, but the process is similar on Linux. First, fetch a couple of dependencies. I need bash, git, and python. Then I need three extra Python packages. Jinja2 is a template engine. Setup tools should be self-explanatory. It's setup tools. And YAML is the markup language that Ansible uses. I also like to create a symlink to my Python interpreter in user local bin if it doesn't already exist. OpenBSD also has, let's say, unsophisticated Unicode support. You need to make sure you're using the right environment variable here, and since I'm an English speaker, I put enus.utf8 into my profile. This is my public domain corn shell profile, by the way, but if you want to use bash as your default shell and set this in bash instead, that's fine too. I define a path where I want to put Ansible in my home directory, and then I clone it from the GitHub repo. I check out the latest stable branch. Here it's stable-2.9. And from a bash prompt, I run source hacking slash env dash setup. And now my Ansible setup is ready to rock. I can do this from multiple Ansible controllers running multiple different OSs, and my playbooks are going to work across all of them. Old Ansible compatibility problems used to bite me all the time until I started setting up Ansible this way. I want to spend my time writing and running playbooks, not fixing regressions in syntax when I need to get something done in a different network, especially when I already solved it somewhere else. I want a consistent Ansible environment everywhere, and this is how I get it. To run Ansible, you specify the Ansible command and an inventory file, and then the name of the Ansible module you want to run and the name of the group in your inventory file where you want that module to be run. More often, though, you'll run ansible-playbook and give the inventory file and the path to your playbook file. The inventory syntax is basic. You define the name of your group and then one host per line, either a fully qualified domain name or an IP address. And it helps if you have a set of variables to define certain properties about that group in a section called group name colon vars. Here I'm just defining some built-in Ansible values to tell Ansible that when I want to contact this 10.0.0.9 host, it uses do as for elevating super users. I'm also giving it an explicit path to Python I want it to use, and then I'm providing the name, port, and private key I want it to use when it SSHs into that host. Pretty basic. Playbook syntax isn't much more complicated. This is the YAML format of the markup language I mentioned. Three dashes, and then there's three sections. A hosts section, where we put the group name from our inventory file. We can define variables in the var section. Then we define tasks in the section called tasks. Each task gets a name, where we put a description of why that task exists or what it's doing and then the name of the Ansible module and any arguments we want to give to that module. So if you don't feel like running up OBSD by hand every six months when a new release comes out, and I know I don't, you can write an Ansible playbook that will build your auto-installation ISO for you. Instead of writing out a static response file, I can record my responses as vars, the server name, the network interface, the root password hash, and so on. And I can install the up OBSD package and rsync with the openbsd underscore pkg module. This just runs package add for me, and since I need to be super user, I make sure this task gets the line become colon yes in it. Become means become super user for this task. In older versions of Ansible, it used to be called sudo colon yes, but sudo isn't the only way to get elevated privilege anymore. And to speak to my earlier point about avoiding incompatible Ansible syntax on different Ansible controllers, yes, I had sudo yes in all my playbooks and had to convert them to become yes in order to get them to run on a newer version of Ansible on a different machine after sudo had been deprecated in the Ansible language syntax. Don't make the same mistake I made. Don't install Ansible from a package. 
Here I'm using rsync to fetch the install sets and put them into the 6.5 slash amd64 directory so I can install them from the ISO. I need to change my response file to look for these sets here, of course, but I don't need to fetch the bsd.rd ram disk file because up obsd will do that for me. I also don't have a static response file anymore. I have a response file template called conf65.j2. This is a Jinja2 template file that will be copied over to the target OpenBSD host and have all these squiggly bracket sections replaced with the variables I've defined in my playbook in the vars section. The host name, the network interface, and the password hash I keep in the playbook, and I update them as needed. The only thing I need to change in this template is when I need to add or modify any of the questions. I can go another step further and set up my install.site script here as a template too. This site script template only does four things. It puts a username into the do as file. I don't need to add this user here because I can do that in the response file. I just have to make sure that the OpenBSD remote user variable is in the right place in both templates. I do the OpenBSD Unicode thing so it's in that user's profile, and I add the Python package. The version of Python is hard-coded in this example to save screen space. Lastly, I call the all-important eject cd0. This ejects the ISO from my VM so it can boot from disk when it's done. These steps, adding a user to the do as config file and installing Python, along with defining an SSH public key for that user, and starting SSH by default in my auto install response file are all I need to make this VM accessible with Ansible. I either specify an IP address for this machine in advance, or I get its IP from my hypervisor and put that IP into my Ansible inventory file so I can begin managing it as soon as it comes online. I hope you're starting to see how powerful this kind of automation can be, especially when you want to start getting consistent deployments across multiple machines. To fill in those templates with the values I want and put them in the right place inside the ISO, I use the template Ansible module here and I specify the name of the template file, the name I want the output file to be called, and I can even set its mode. I'm using an Ansible feature here called loop that, as you can imagine, runs this template module over and over again in a loop once per item that I give it. And I'm passing it two items right now each with their own source path, destination path, and file mode. Use loop in your playbooks anywhere you want to manage multiple things in the same way. Lastly, I'm running up OBSD here with the shell module. I use the shell module in Ansible a lot. It just runs a freeform command that you give it. It's really useful. And to make sure all of these arguments I'm passing into the up OBSD script fit on screen, I'm hard coding them into this Ansible task. But you should use variables here for the version and the architecture. Even the mirror doesn't need to be a fixed value in the task. Same thing for the second task, where I run make hybrid. A practical Ansible playbook will have a variable in all of the places where the version of OpenBSD is being passed to it. You shouldn't hard code the OpenBSD version string everywhere, since all of these parts of automating the install process, the response file, the site script, the Ansible playbook that builds the ISO, could all have pieces that are unique to a specific release that may not work with future releases. OpenBSD is rather stable, but it isn't totally static. Every release works a little bit differently. There's the obvious expectation that package version numbers are going to change, but be aware that new packages will get added over time. Spoilers, I'll mention this again in a bit. And the OpenBSD installer itself will ask different questions from release to release, so you still need to make tweaks to the UpOBSD playbook over time. This is why I call my response file in my site script conf65 and site65. I also have a conf66 and a site66. And as I record this, OpenBSD 6.7 is coming out any day now. And by having a template of conf65, 66, and 67, I can test a new OpenBSD release and not have to worry too much if I need to undo any changes so I can still revise playbooks that are tuned to the version I'm already running in production. I haven't shown you how to put the disk label template file into the ISO. The up OBSD script doesn't support this, not directly, but it's just a script, so you can patch that script if you want. The key function to look for is one called uo underscore add file, or if you're feeling brave, you can use the underlying program that up OBSD uses. It's called elfrd setroot, 
and you can use it to reverse engineer the UpOBSD script. This is more useful than just copying the disk label template into the RAM disk. It allows you to edit the OpenBSD install.subinstaller script directly. Be very careful if you do this. OpenBSD 6.7 changed the default file system in the installer, and I didn't like that. So I edited install.sub to change it back. If you aren't extremely comfortable with BSD and how it works, don't touch the installer. I wrote a quick article about how to do this in preparation for this talk, and I put it online. Check it out if you want to know more. In my case, I'm using Hyper-V to create my VMs before I upload them to the cloud. You don't have to use Hyper-V like I do. You can use any virtual machine management tool that creates VHD files. I've used Oracle VirtualBox in the past, and I've had quite a bit of success with QEMU, too. But in PowerShell, on my Hyper-V host, I can create a VHD virtual hard disk file from a script, and I can attach that VHD to a VM, and I can attach the ISO we made from our up OBSD playbook. As soon as the VM boots the ISO, our custom RAM disk runs our response file and installs OpenBSD for us. When the OS is installed, our custom install.site script runs, sets up doas.conf, installs Python, and ejects the virtual CD from the VM. As I mentioned earlier, that's all we need to make our VM accessible by Ansible. If you wanted extra credit here too, Ansible can manage Windows boxes. This is more advanced than just enabling WinRM, but you have some options. I won't cover them here, but if you're curious, it can be done. Finally, we need to figure out how to put our OpenBSD VMs in Azure. The good news is that Microsoft published documentation on how to do this back in 2017, but I'm not even going to bother showing it to you here because it's wrong. If you try to follow the docs, you'll get an error. You can figure out what the right steps to take are, but those steps require you to use WA Linux Agent, which is the Windows Azure Linux Agent. It's the software that your VM uses to get instructions from Azure. WA Linux Agent has a dependency on OpenSSL, and OpenBSD doesn't like OpenSSL. Fortunately, Reich Floater is an OpenBSD developer who wrote Cloud Agent. Cloud Agent is designed specifically for OpenBSD. It's a replacement for WA Linux Agent that is lightweight and uses LibreSSL, which is the OpenBSD fork of OpenSSL. Now, if you're like me and you're still using an old version of OpenBSD like 6.5, you will need to download and install Cloud Agent. But from OpenBSD 6.6 onward, there's a package for it. So all you need to do is run do as package add cloud agent and you're set. Then all you need to do is edit two files like this, etsy hostname.hvn0 and etsy boot.com. These are static files that have to look exactly like this. Once these files are in position, I can stop the VM and upload the VHD file to Azure to create an Azure image from it. Then I can make VMs by hand, just the same as I made an Ubuntu VM in the portal back at the start of the talk. But we don't have to do that because Ansible can support all sorts of cloud operations. In fact, there are cloud modules for quite a few cloud providers, so you AWS users are in luck. And if you use Google or DigitalOcean or one of a dozen other cloud companies, Ansible can help you do deployments there too. Check the docs online and see if your cloud provider has modules. Now the bad news. OpenBSD isn't a supported architecture for running Azure and Ansible together. But I've got your back. Install the Python pip package and use it to install pip env. This is a Python utility that allows you to install multiple Python packages in different directories. And it's really useful when you have two different Python utilities with incompatible or contradictory prerequisites. So I make two directories, one called Azure Modules, and I run pip env install ansible azure inside it. The other I call CLI Azure, and I install Azure-CLI into it. I didn't cover Azure CLI, but it's a really useful tool for managing Azure from the command line. If you won't use Ansible, Azure CLI can still help you out managing Azure resources. I'm using dash dash pre here because Azure CLI sometimes uses funky Python packages that aren't fully published yet, so I need to make sure that using pre-release versions is okay when I try to install the CLI. You can probably guess by now, you can install these modules with an Ansible playbook instead of doing it by hand. There's two things you need to do to make your OpenBSD Ansible controller work with your Azure subscription. 
you authenticate against Azure by running pip env run az login dash dash use device code. You have to do this from the directory where you install the Azure CLI. It gives you a unique authentication token that you can then write down and use to authenticate from a separate machine that has a browser. I don't have a browser on my Ansible controller, so I use this code to authenticate on it from any other machine I have hanging around. Once the Ansible controller is authenticated, I want to set the default Azure subscription where I am going to be doing my deployments. This is all I need Azure CLI to do for me to get Ansible working with Azure, and I only have to do it once. But the CLI is a handy tool, so I like to keep it around. I set up Ansible the same as before by running source hacking env setup from a bash prompt. Then instead of using pip env run to run one command one time only, I run pip env shell to get a persistent shell in my Azure modules directory. If I want to create an Azure VM, I just run an Ansible playbook from inside my pip env Azure modules directory in a bash shell. Because the playbook will be giving instructions to the Microsoft Azure front end, and not to a real host, Ansible is going to get confused, so I'm specifying that the target group is localhost. And because I don't need Ansible to figure out anything about how the target host is set up, I can put gather facts no here to save time. Ansible by default evaluates target machines to make managing them easier, but it's not information I want or need to do a cloud deployment. I start with the name of the VHD file I created and prepped with Cloud Agent and the location to the Azure storage account where I uploaded it. I define a task called Azure underscore RM underscore image and I give it some arguments. The name of the image I want to create, the resource group name and geographical location, the source of the VHD file, and I have to use OS type Linux here because Azure only differentiates between Windows VMs and Linux VMs and I have to pick the one that's closest to the truth. As Shakespeare once wrote, this is the unkindest cut of all. Lastly, I run Azure RM Virtual Machine and I create a new VM, also giving a name, a resource group, and a location. But here, I also include a size for the VM and the name of the image that I just created. I also pick a username and a password. You'll note that I already created a user account when I installed OpenBSD, so I don't need Azure to set up a new admin account for me. But Azure is going to try to do so no matter what. So it doesn't matter what I put here, so long as Azure doesn't mess with my do-as file. And Azure is definitely going to try to do that. So here's the big secret that lets you run OpenBSD on Azure. Lock down your doas.cont file so that Azure can't touch it. If I run this before I upload the VHD, my OpenBSD VM will keep the right super user permissions, so I can manage it remotely with Ansible no matter how Azure tries to set up an admin account for me. There are plenty of other Azure management modules, and they all have descriptive names like Azure RM Image, which lets you add and remove images, Azure RM Public IP Address, so you can connect to your VM, Azure RM Storage Account, which handles your files, and of course, Azure RM Virtual Machine, which, you guessed it. If you want to query Azure and get information on resources that you may or may not already have, most Azure modules have an info module. Azure RM Image Info, for example, or Azure RM Virtual Machine Info. Ansible's info modules don't make changes. They just see what's out there and report back what it found, which lets you set up conditionals during a deployment, like Look for a VM called X. If X is not found, then create a VM called X. A well-written Ansible playbook will be idempotent. If you run it over and over again, it makes all the right choices in what to do, so you end up with the same desired end result whether it's the first time you run the playbook or the 100th. Info modules are a key part of that capability. And even if there isn't an Azure module specifically for the feature you want, there's a generic module called Azure RM Resource, which is a universal Azure resource wrapper. If you really wanted, you could do everything you need in Azure with just Azure RM Resource module. So if there's a specific feature in Azure you want, but the Ansible module for it doesn't exist yet, you can still create it with Azure RM Resource. So, wrapping up what I've covered, 
you can automate the creation of an OpenBSD auto-installing ISO with Ansible. You can use that ISO to automatically install OpenBSD onto a VM. You can customize that VM with Ansible both during and after the installation process. You can use Ansible to automate deploying that VM into the cloud. And when you have your VMs up and running, you can still use Ansible to manage them, tear them down, and build new ones as your service needs change. Azure really only needs a VHD with an appropriate agent running on it. OpenBSD is a lean OS, and the cloud agent package is a great way to use OpenBSD in the cloud. Ansible's real strength comes from its ability to manage multiple different domains, from the local host to remote machines to the cloud at scale, and it handles all of them with one uniform syntax that you can learn and understand. And all of this is possible because of the simplicity of OpenBSD's very versatile auto-install mechanism. Thank you, OpenBSD. And remember, in the end, geeks win. And with that, thank you for your time.